Christmas and good morning. Today is Christmas Day, the day we celebrate the birth of Christ. Merry Christmas again to you. We are home for the holidays. We are gathered together in our homes or wherever we may be watching from as Northminster and St. David's United Churches together as communities of faith. Let us give thanks as we begin every worship service each day, each Sunday of the year, that we have our Treaty 7 Truth and Reconciliation candle lit, giving thanks that we live, work, worship, and play on Treaty 7 land. We also have our rainbow candle lit, a reminder to us of our commitment to full inclusive welcome, that there are no barriers to knowing God's love and being part of community. Today is a, it's really a wonderful blending of voices and faces from both Northminster and St. David's. You will be enjoying Christmas songs prepared by Northminster's music team from our video collection that we have created the last few years. And you'll also enjoy at the end of worship a beautiful organ piece that Brent Tucker has prepared for us today. So let us worship this Christmas morning. If you have ever been involved in a situation where a child was born, you know that the day after can be exhilarating, but also energetically low. A lot of energy was expended. And now what sinks in is the thought of, the rest of our life and the next steps in this journey, or at least maybe the next few months of giving yourself totally to this little human that was newly born, who is completely dependent on you for all its needs. There is the crying and the baby, but also you, also though the anticipation that had grown has now burst and now there's just those tasks, those endless tasks of figuring out how it is going to be in this new state. This is also how it is no matter what new creative moment has happened. In many times in our lives, the idea of birthing can also mean changing jobs or moving or starting in a new school or a shift in a relationship, or maybe a loss that you weren't expecting. It seems that, like that day after a newborn enters the world, there's the joy and the hard work, the wonder and the fear, and how that seems to grow together. So I invite you today, in this moment, in the midst of whatever is going on for you, whatever Christmas day might look like, whether that's the joy and the chaos and the energy and sometimes even the stress in those traditions or perhaps the day is more 
peaceful, more calm. Perhaps it's a day of solitude. Whatever the energy and the emotions and the events are for this day and whatever you are feeling right now, just to be comfortable in this moment, to take a pause from everything else and for you to just be comfortable where you are sitting, to maybe close your eyes. And that will feel good if you've been up really early with little ones this morning. And to just allow a vision of light to cascade over you. To breathe in that warmth. To envision that light, anointing all that you are feeling as how that is actually reflecting the sacred. Know in this time that you are not alone. All the candles in our Advent wreath, hope and peace and joy and love are lit, and especially our Christ candle, which we lit last night at Christmas Eve worship. Candles giving thanks for the gift of light and especially the light born in a stable, being born into the world. Let's pray. God, we pray for comfort this day. We open to see the sacred reflected in all things. We open to see each thing that is born as gift of holy presence. This is the gift of Christ's mystery, lighting the way to calm. Living God, Christ mystery, spirit of calm, we give you thanks for this physical and online space for which we gather. As we take in the comforts you offer, may we be a reflection of your light, expanding the sacred sense of surprise into the sacred sense of purpose. Amen. Let's now sing together.
our sad division cease, and before us the Prince of Peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Good morning and Merry Christmas. In the early church, Sunday was known as the day of light, and so it is special when Christmas falls on a Sunday, as it does today. As light dawns on this morning, as the children scramble to the tree to see what has appeared, we remember that the sacred comes in the form of surprise sometimes, just as it did when light and life was known anew in the form of a baby in a, in a humble stable. Can we dare to believe that we can know a surprising calm, even in the midst of anxiety, because of the inbreaking of this Prince of Peace upon our lives each and every day? Hear this first reading from John, John 1, verses 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not overtake it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light. So that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. <clears throat> he was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory as of a parent's only child. Full of grace. And truth. Word of God. Word of life. Thanks be to God. The Christmas Miracle of Jonathan Toomey. The village children called him Mr. Gloomy, but in fact his name was Toomey, Mr. Jonathan Toomey. And though it's not kind to call people names, this one fit quite well. For Jonathan Toomey seldom smiled and never laughed. He went around mumbling and grumbling, muttering and sputtering, grumping and griping. He complained that the church bells rang too often, that the birds sang too shrilly, and the children played too loudly. Mr. Toomey was a woodcarver, 
Some said he was the best wood carver in the whole valley. He spent his days sitting at his workbench, carving beautiful shapes from blocks of pine and hickory and chestnut wood. After supper, he sat in a straight back chair near the fireplace, smoking his pipe and staring into the flames. Jonathan Toomey wasn't an old man, but if you saw him, you might think he was, the way he walked bent forward with his head down. You wouldn't notice his eyes, the clear blue of an August sky. And you wouldn't see the dimple on his chin, since his face was mostly hidden under a shaggy, untrimmed beard, speckled with sawdust and wood shavings, and depending on what he ate that day, with crumbs of bread or a bit of potato or dried gravy. The village people didn't know it, but there was a reason for his gloom, a reason for his grumbling, a reason why he walked hunched over as if carrying a great weight on his shoulders. Some years earlier, when Jonathan Toomey was young and full of life and full of love, his wife and baby became very sick. And because those were the days before hospitals and medicines and skilled doctors, his wife and baby died three days apart from each other. So Jonathan Toomey had packed up his belongings into a wagon and traveled until his tears stopped. He settled into a tiny house at the edge of a village to do his wood carving. One day in early December, there was a knock at Jonathan's door. Mumbling and grumbling, he went to answer it. There stood a woman and a young boy. I'm the widow McDowell. I live in your village. This is my son, Thomas, the woman said. I'm seven and I know how to whistle, said Thomas. Whistling is pish posh, the woodcarver said gruffly. I need something carved, said the woman, and she told Jonathan about a very special set of Christmas figures her grandfather had carved for her when she was a little girl. After I moved here, I discovered they were lost, she explained. I had hoped that by some miracle I would find them again, but it hasn't happened. <laughs> There's no such thing as miracles, the woodcarver told her. Now can you describe these figures for me? There were sheep, she told him. Two of them were curly, curly wooled sheep, added Thomas. Yes, two, said the wid widow, and a cow, an angel, Mary, Joseph, the baby Jesus, and the wise men. Three of them, added Thomas. Will you take the job, asked the widow McDowell. I will. Oh, I'm grateful. How soon can you have them ready? They'll be ready when they're ready, he said. But I must have them for Christmas. They mean very much to me. I can't remember a Christmas without them. <laughs> Christmas is pish posh, said Jonathan gruffly, and he shut the door. The following week, there was a knock at the wood carver's door. Muttering and sputtering, he went to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell and Thomas. Excuse me, said the widow, but Thomas has been begging to come and watch you work. He says he wants to be a woodcarver when he grows up. Would you, would you like him to watch? I've been told you're the best in the valley. I'll be quiet. I won't, you won't even know I'm here. Please, please, piped in Thomas with a grumble. The woodcarver stepped aside to let them in. He pointed to the stool near the wood bench. No talking, no jiggling, no noise, he ordered Thomas. And the widow McDowell handed Mr. Toomey a warm loaf of cornbread as a token of thanks. Then she took out her knitting and sat down in a rocking chair in the far corner of the cottage. Not there, bellowed the woodcarver. No one sits in that chair. So she moved to the straight back chair by the fire. Thomas sat very still, 
Once, when he needed to sneeze, he pressed a finger under his nose to hold it back. Once, when he wanted desperately to scratch his leg, he counted to 20 to keep his mind off the itch. After a long time, Thomas cleared his throat and whispered, Mr. Toomey, may I ask you a question? The woodcarver glared at Thomas, then shrugged his shoulders and grunted. Thomas decided it meant yes. So he went on. Is that my sheep you're carving? The woodcarver carver nodded and grunted again. After a very long time, Thomas Winster whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but you're carving my sheep all wrong. The widow McDowell's knitting needles stopped clicking. Jonathan Toomey's knife stopped carving. Thomas went on. It's a beautiful sheep, nice and curly, but my sheep looked happy. That's pish posh, said Mr. Toomey. Sheep are sheep, they cannot look happy. Mine did, answered Thomas. They knew they were with the baby Jesus, so they were happy. After that, Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. When the church bells chimed at six o'clock, Mr. Toomey grumbled under his breath about that awful noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas sneezed three times, then thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of cornbread and boiled potatoes, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his knife, he picked up the sheep, and he worked till his eyelids drooped. A few days later, there was a knock at the carver's door. Grupping and grumbling, he went to answer it. There stood the widow and her son. May I watch again? I will be quiet, said Thomas. He settled himself on the stool very quietly, while his mother laid a basket of sweet-smelling raisin buns on the table. The teapot is warm, Mr. Toomey said gruffly, his head bent over his work. While Mr. Toomey carved, the widow MacDonald poured the tea. She touched the woodcarver gently on his shoulder and placed a cup of tea and a bun next to him. He pretended not to notice but soon both plate and cup were empty. Thomas tried to eat his bun his mother had given him as quietly as he could, but it was almost impossible to be seven and to eat a warm, sticky raisin bun without making various smacking, licking, and satisfied noises. When Thomas had finished, he tried to sit quietly once he almost hiccuped, but he took a deep breath and held it till his face turned red. And once, without thinking, he began to swing his legs, but a glare from the woodcarver stopped him, and he kept them so still they fell asleep. After a very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Grunt. Is that my cow you're carving? Nod, grunt. After a very long time went by, then Thomas cleared his throat and said, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but I must tell you something. That is a beautiful cow, the most beautiful cow I've ever seen, but it's not right. My cow looked proud. <coughs> That's pish posh, growled the wood carver. Cows are cows, they can't look proud. My cow did. It knew that Jesus chose to be born in his barn. He was so proud. Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. The only sounds that could be heard was the scraping of the carving knife, the humming of the widow McDowell, and the click, click of her knitting needles. When the church bells chimed at six o'clock, Mr. Toomey muttered under his breath about the noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas shook first one leg and then the other. He thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. 
That evening, after supper of boiled potatoes and raisin buns, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his carving knife. He picked up the cow. He worked until his eyelids drooped. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. He smoothed down his hair as he went to answer it. At the door was the widow and her son. May I watch again? asked Thomas. As Mrs. McDowell warmed the tea and put a plate of fresh molasses cookies on the workbench, Thomas watched the woodcarver work on the figure of the angel. After a very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, is that my angel you're carving? Yes, and would you do me the favor of telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong? Well, my angel looked like one of God's most important angels because it was sent to baby Jesus. And just how does one make an angel look important? Asked the woodcarver. You'll be able to do it, said Thomas. You're the best woodcarver in the valley. After another very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Do you ever stop talking? Asked the woodcarver. My mother says I don't. She says I could learn about the virtue of silence from you. Under his beard, the woodcarver's face turned pink. The widow McDowell's face turned as red as the scarf she was knitting. Well, speak up. What's your question? Would you please teach me how to carve? I'm a very busy man, grumbled the woodcarver. But he put down the important angel. You'll carve a bird. A robin, I hope, said Thomas. I like robins. With a piece of charcoal, the woodcarver sketched a robin on a piece of brown paper. He handed it to Thomas with a small block of pine and a knife. He showed him how to lop the corners of the block and slowly smooth the edges of the wood into curves. Thomas copied the woodcarver's strokes, head bent, tongue working from side to side of his lower lip as he concentrated. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Jonathan Toomey was holding Thomas's hand in his, guiding the knife along the edge of the wing. He didn't hear them ringing. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas brushed wood shavings from his shirt. Then he reached out and brushed two especially large pieces of wood shaving from Jonathan Toomey's beard. He thanked the woodcarver for teaching him how to carve. Later, after a supper of boiled potatoes and molasses cookies, Jonathan Toomey went to his workbench. He thought for a long time. He sketched drawing after drawing. Finally, he picked up his carving knife, he picked up the angel, and he carved until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. Mr. Toomey jumped up to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell with a bouquet of pine bow bows and holly springs dotted with cherries. And there stood Thomas, clutching his partly carved robin. While Thomas and Mr. Toomey carved, Mrs. McDowell put the bouquet in a jar of water. She scrubbed Mr. Toomey's kitchen table and set the jar in the center on a pretty cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies, which she found in a drawer below the cupboard. Next, I will carve the wise men and Joseph, the woodcarver said to Thomas. Perhaps before I begin, you will tell me all the mistakes I'm going to make. Well, said Thomas, my wise men were wearing their most wonderful robes because they were going to visit Jesus and my Joseph was leaning over the baby Jesus like he was protecting him. He looked very serious. It wasn't until the church bells had chimed and the widow and her son were preparing to go that Mr. Toomey saw the jar of pine boughs and the scrub table and the cloth embroidered with lilies and the lily of the valley. I found the cloth in the drawer. I thought it would look pretty on the table, the widow McDowell said, smiling. Never open that drawer. When the two had left, Jonathan put the cloth away. 
That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes, the woodcarver worked on Joseph and the wise men until his eyes drooped shut. After a few days, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He dusted the crumbs from his beard and brushed the sawdust from his shirt. At the door were the widow, McDowell, and Thomas. All afternoon, Thomas watched the woodcarver work. When it was time to leave, Jonathan said to Thomas, I'm about to begin the last two figures, Mary and the baby. Can you tell me how your figures looked? Oh, they were the most special of all, said Thomas. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to his mother, and Mary looked like she loved him very much. Thank you, Thomas, said the woodcarver. Tomorrow is Christmas. Is there any chance the figures would be ready, the widow McDowell asked. They'll be ready when they're ready. I understand, said the widow, and she handed Jonathan two packages. Merry Christmas, she said. Jonathan folded his arms across his chest. I want no presents, he said harshly. That is exactly why we are giving them, answered the widow. She put them down on the table and left. Jonathan sat down at the table. Slowly, he opened the first package. Inside was a red scarf, hand knit, warm and bright, and he tied the scarf around his neck. The other package held a robin, crudely carved of pine. <laughs> a smile twitched at the corner of Jonathan's mouth as he ran his fingers over the lopsided wings. He dusted the fireplace mantle with his sleeve and placed the robin exactly in the center so he could see it from his chair. The woodcarver did not eat supper that day. Instead, he began to sketch the final figures, Mary and Jesus. He drew Mary and then wadded the sketch into a ball and tossed it on the floor. He drew the baby, wadded the, the sketch into a ball and tossed it with the first. He sketched again. Once more, he crumpled the paper. Soon there was a small mountain of crumpled papers at his feet. He picked up a block of wood and tried to carve, but his knife would not do what he wanted it to do. He hurled the chunk of wood into the fireplace and sat staring into the flames. When he heard the church bells announcing the midnight Christmas service, he got up. Slowly, he opened the door drawer beneath the cupboard, the drawer he had told the widow never to open. From it, he took the cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies. He took up the rough wooden shawl and a lace handkerchief. He took out a tiny white baby blanket and a little pair of blue socks. He placed each one gently on the floor. From the bottom of the drawer, he lifted out a picture frame, beautifully carved of deep brown chestnut wood. The frame was a charcoal sketch of a woman sitting in a rocking chair, holding a baby. The woman's arms, the baby's arms reached up, touching the woman's face. The woman was looking down at the baby, smiling. Jonathan sat down in his rocking chair and began holding the chest, the picture to his chest. He rocked slowly, his eyes closed, and two tears trailed into his beard. When he finally took the picture to his workbench and began to carve, his fingers worked nick quickly and surely. He carved all through the night. The next day there was a knock on the widow McDowell's door. When she opened it, there was the woodcarver, his neck wrapped in a red scarf holding a wooden box stuffed with straw. Mr. Toomey, said the widow, what a surprise. Merry Christmas. The figures are ready, he said as he stepped inside. From the box, Jonathan unpacked two curly sheep, happy sheep because they were with Jesus. He unpacked a proud cow, cow and an angel a very important angel with mighty wings stretching from its shoulders right down to the hem of its gown. He unpacked three wise men wearing their most wonderful robes, edged with fur and falling in rich folds. He unpacked a serious and caring Joseph. He unpacked Mary wearing a rough shawl, looking down, loving her precious baby son. Jesus was smiling, reaching up to talk to touch his mother's face. 
That day, Jonathan went to the Christmas service with the widow McDowell and Thomas. And that day, in the churchyard, the village children <clears throat> saw Jonathan throw back his head, showing his eyes as clear as the August sky, and laughed. No one ever called him Mr. Gloomy again. A Merry Christmas. On this beautiful Christmas day, let's pray. Let's pray twice as I read a poem as our prayer. Getting to the Front of the Stable by Anne Weems. Who put Joseph in the back of the stable? Who dressed him in brown and put a staff in his hand and told him to stand in the back of the crush, background for the magnificent light of the Madonna? God chosen. This man, Joseph, was faithful, in spite of the gossip in Nazareth, in spite of the danger from Herod. 
This man, Joseph, listened to angels, and it was he who named the child Emmanuel. Is this a man to be stuck for centuries in the back of the stable? Actually, Joseph probably stood in the doorway, guarding the mother and child, or greeting shepherds and kings. When he wasn't in the doorway, he was probably urging Mary to get some rest, gently covering her with his cloak, assuring her that he would watch the child. Actually, he probably picked the child up in his arms and walked him in the night, patting him lovingly until he closed his eyes. This Christmas, let us give thanks to God for this man of incredible faith, into whose care God placed the Christ child. As a gesture of gratitude, let us put Joseph in the front of the stable, where he can guard and greet and cast an occasional glance at this child who brought us life. And may each of us reach our potential and move forward in this next year coming up. And may we be blessed by this Christ child. Amen. blessing as we end this time of worship. When you see lights twinkle, when you catch a reflection in a mirror, when you notice the sunlight dancing on a surface, or a nightlight glowing in the darkness, let these signs be the Christ light revealed for you again and again in and through the world. Go into the world knowing that your brilliant presence is pouring more light into a weary world. Remember, God loves us by becoming us. This means that you already are reflecting the sacred. In the name of the Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for being here in this way, in this sacred time, this Christmas day. 
Next Sunday on New Year's Day, we are back in person for a beautiful uh, music-filled service led by our worship team. And watch all of your weekly emails for what's happening in January, in the new year and beyond. So Christmas blessings to you, and we will see you soon. Bye for now. Let's sing again. Oh